All righty, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and start. I think we have a few more people filtering in, but we do have some another group in behind us, so we're going to try to stay on schedule here. Welcome to this 10th and final presentation of the Interagency Brown Bag Lecture Series for this academic year. On behalf of uh, our partners at the Command General Staff College uh, course, Marv Nichols and Colonel Rob Alt, it's my pleasure to welcome you. For those of you I don't know, I'm Rod Cox with the Command General Staff College Foundation, and it's our pleasure to put together this interagency series that helps to enhance the uh, just that, the interagency education for the students and faculty here at the Command General Staff College. So thank you all for coming. And it looks like we have largely a non-student audience. One gentleman, are you a student back there? Oh, welcome. Come on up to the front. <laughs> well, so anyway, I want to recognize our sponsors because without them we couldn't do this. So the First Command team, and there's a couple of folks here, thank you very much. First Command's been our name sponsor of this event uh, for this academic year, and, and it's through their understanding of the importance that we're able to bring this. So thanks to First Command, and then of course to the Pro Foundation for our Simon Center funding. Now today's presentation, as I mentioned, this is the last in the series for this year. Um, we're going to learn about an organization that serves as a kind of a chamber of commerce, if you will, for the federal agencies that, that provide uh, synergistic services um, and agencies I found, find very useful. And specifically talking to our, our soldier that's here from the class, um, it's important for you to know that there's federal executive boards that operate across the nation. And I think part of uh, Mr. Heisel's briefing, he's going to talk about that. Um, but you might wonder, why would this matter? Why, why was this fit into the interagency curriculum that we want to offer here? Well, just by its nature, I just mentioned, it's the kind of an overarching agency that um, oversees and integrates functions for all agencies of government, to include Department of Defense, but all the others that are here. And for those of you who don't know, this is a region headquarters, so there's quite a few headquarters of federal agencies here in the community. And so that, how that impacts on largely the soldier population here is, is that when you have assignments that are going to take you anywhere in CONUS, uh, most likely if you're a command of battalion or a brigade or you're an installation commander, um, it's very smart for you to know that probably there's a federal executive board that exists in the town near your installation. And so it's a, an activity and a tool that you should be aware of that you can tap into for the betterment of your soldiers um, and their families in the community. So that's the reason why I think this is important that we do this here. So having said that, I also want to mention that as a taxpayer, some of the things that uh, Mr. Heisel is going to talk about that they do on, on our behalf for the rest of us um, make me feel very good because they save the government and various agencies lots of our tax dollars in some of the services that they offer both in-house and gratuitous because of their memberships and things they're doing. You'll see how that works out here shortly. So it's my pleasure to present today's presenter, Mr. Larry Heisel has led the Kansas City Federal Executive Board since 2013. He took that position after serving as a senior program manager at the Office of Personnel Management. Uh, he holds a bachelor's in business administration from Thomas Edison State University and is very active as a community volunteer in the Kansas City area. Please welcome the Executive Director of the Greater Kansas City Federal Executive Board, Mr. Larry Heisel. Thank you, Rod. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I guess everyone's on this side of the room, so I'll just head over here a little bit. Uh, thanks to the General Staff Command College and the Simon Center for inviting me here today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come up here and educate folks about the uh, Federal Executive Board. Real quick, how many of you have ever heard of the Federal Executive Board before? Were you here last year? That's, okay, that's, that's how. So we are kind of the uh, unicorn of the government, if you will. Uh, we are very small. We're not even an appropriated agency. Uh, we are funded by various, uh, various other federal agencies throughout the country, So, and I'll explain a little bit about that as we go along. So um, as Rod said, we are similar to like a chamber of commerce just for federal agencies in, in the Kansas City community. For example, here in Kansas City, being a regional hub, there's 160 different federal agencies that all report directly to DC. We're the ones that get them to communicate locally. Like Leavenworth, be, Leavenworth being very much a, a federal community, Kansas City is as well. There's over 28,000 federal employees, civilian employees, located in the Kansas City area proper. So again, a, a large workforce and a big impact on the overall community, not only the Kansas City uh, proper, but also the, the metropolitan area. So I'm going to go through this today and just kind of give you an idea of what, so, what the FEBs do. 
across the nation and also some unique qualities of the federal agencies within the Kansas City area as well. So what is the FEB? Well, FEB was established back in 1961. Back in, before 1961, um, you know, at that time the Kennedy administration looked at, at the, across the country and said, you know, we are, you know, we're getting communication out towards all our federal employees in the D.C. area, but there's 85% of our, our workforce out there that we're not communicating with very well. So let's establish some type of program that we can get the communications out. And at that time, of course, telephone, triplicate uh, copies and such like that. But uh, so they established the first 10 and then finally up to 28 FEBs across the country. Most of them being either in um, regional hubs like Kansas City or um, cities that have a large um, congregation of uh, federal employees. So we're overseen by the Office of Personnel Management. Um, and then again, the 28, and I'll show you the, those cities here. So in case you do move somewhere else, you might be able to find where those. But our job is to provide a forum which federal leaders can collaborate to accomplish shared outcomes. So here you see the United States, and you can kind of see where the six regions are, are broken down also. Kansas City being right smack in the middle, and we are in region six of the, uh, the General Service Administration. Generally, here is for the federal, federal agencies, um, the states of Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, and Nebraska are considered the heartland region. So, and centered right in the Kansas City, Kansas City area. There's 38,000 that federal folks that we cover. There's about 70,000 federal, federal employees within the, the six, uh, um, excuse me, the, uh, the uh, four state uh, region there. You can kind of see some of the other uh, FEB locations across the country. Uh, interesting enough, there's not an FEB in Washington, D.C. You might think, well, who needs to collaborate more than Washington, D.C., right? Uh, however, the closest thing to FEB would be the, the uh, Chico Council. Are you familiar with the Chico Council? Council? This is Chief Human Capital Officers. So the Chief Human Capital Officers is the head HR person in D.C., they, have, they are part of what they call the Chico Council, and they're the ones that make the decisions and recommendations for federal agencies in the D.C. area. Out here, we're the Chico Council. There we go. As I said, the whole purpose of the, the FEB is we have all these different federal agencies reporting to D.C. or the White House. How can we get them to talk among each other? A lot of them have this, you know, similar missions or they, they're working on the same programs, they just don't know about it. So it's our job to keep our ear to the ground and find out what uh, other federal agencies are doing so we can let, you know, if, if uh, GSA is working on an a environmental impact program, who, who should be their partners? Well, obviously EPA should be one, but also HHS. You want to reach out and you also want to look at HUD. You want to look at, you know, things you don't think about, SBA, you know, when we have, when there are disasters and, you know, what happens when a disaster goes in? Who takes care of that? FEMA. But does P FEMA pay those folks? No, actually SBA, Small Business Administration, actually makes payments. So again, it's, it's, a, it's important for all these agencies to be able to communicate and have some type of liaison to, to work, work through issues. So again, purpose, coordination activities outside, and to provide better collaboration within the agencies in, the, in their focused area. Um, the core functions, there is old saying that once you've seen one FEB, you've seen one F FEB. We all do things a little bit different because geographically there are, there are agencies that are more important in a certain area than there are others. Fort, Ro Fort Leavenworth, for example, is a, you know, of great importance to, to us here in Kansas City. Also, some of the regional uh, components like Social Security or General Service Administration, EPA, as we said, again, not every FEB is going to have that location. Maybe the bulk of the FEB, in, for example, in uh, San Antonio would be DOD. So again, so the focus is going to change depending upon the FEB. But we all work on generally the same three emission cores, intergovernmental and interagency collaboration, emergency preparedness, security, and employee safety, 
and then workforce development and support. And we'll go through that this, and I'll give you some examples of what we, we've done over the past year, just kind of give you an idea as far as how we work that within the federal, the federal agencies and also um, with our partnerships here in the, the, um, up in uh, Fort Leavenworth. So, who is the FEB? Now, I'm actually just a staff person. Uh, the FEB, my staff is two people, me and someone else. Most FEBs are one-person staffs. So again, there are maybe 40, 40 uh, staff people of F, you know, that work for FEBs across the country. So it's pretty small. As I said, back in 1961, the Kennedy administration said, yeah, this is a great program, but how are we going to fund it? Well, I'll tell you what. What we'll do is, DOD, you've got a lot of folks down in uh, San Antonio. You're going to Air Force, you're going to fund the FEB down there. So HHS, hey, you've got a regional office in Dallas. You're going to fund uh, the Dallas uh, FEB. So that's how, how it works. There was agreement at that time. Different entities would fund the the, their local FEB. Here locally we are funded to the combination of dollars from uh, FAA and the Office of Personnel Management, which again if you're not familiar that's kind of the HR component of the federal government. So again that's you know that varies uh, you know um, who's being funded. What doesn't vary is who is actually the the uh, member of the FEB. So the senior most official of the FEB uh, or the particular agency is the member of the FEB. So the commanding general here in, here in uh, Fort Leavenworth, when they come on board, whether they know it or not, by, by act of uh, legislation, they are automatically a member of the FEB. So uh, again, whoever the senior most official. So here, typically we have the commander general or his uh, executive officer, Kirby Brown, for example, before he retired, served on our executive committee. So it is automatically, once they, they take the size, the FEB size and agency participation varies. Uh, again, we talked, there's over 160 federal agencies in, in Kansas City. So we include a board uh, uh, chairperson and vice chairs, and we do try to represent across the, the government, not only uh, civilian, military, postal, uh, as well as um, 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 justice as well. Uh, there's again a lot of a lot of times people don't realize that uh, the judicial si system, like the U.S. courts, is not really one of the three branches of government. So again, you have no that is three branches. Excuse me. Yes, but it's not really covered by some of the laws that that the executive and administrative branches are covered by. So Kansas City federal presence and kind of give you an idea. Kind of hard to see, but you can see on the far left-hand side as far as some of the larger agencies in the, the Kansas City area. When you look at the federal, federal agencies as far as the permanent employees and contract employees, there's actually over 41,000 federal employees in the Kansas City area. So that uh, constitutes $3 billion in economic impact. So the salary that comes from that is really making a huge uh, benefit uh, to the, the community. And when you look at the acceleration part as far as other agencies that impact from the federal government and on top of that, there's additional $1.2 billion of impact. Uh, federal workforce occupies more than $10 million of lease known space here in the Kansas City area. Again, actually we're getting to a point where other than military installations or courthouses, we're going away from actually having um, federal buildings. Most, most new offices or new agencies that, that move, they're going into lease space. That again is the cost savings to the, uh, to the federal government. Some of the things that we, we tout as far as education, tourism, of course, Fort Leavenworth, Haskell Indian Nations University, the Harry S. Truman Library, the National Archives Records, not only with Brown versus Board of Education, but also um, some of the other, other uh, state, uh, or excuse me, the national park systems like uh, um, the Truman Home, Fort Scott, and the latest one is uh, the uh, Quindaro um, um, landmark that just was installed two weeks ago. Excuse me. So, so some unique agencies in the Kansas City area. And I kind of like to kind of put it into to focus as far as you know the entry point into America. Yeah, you know, a lot of times you look at, a, at Ellis Island, and yes, back when my my answers came, they came through Ellis Island. 
Uh, but now, a lot of folks, when they apply to be part of, part, a citizen of the federal government, it actually starts here in Kansas City. The National Benefits Center, which is located in Lee Summit and also has another office in, in Overland Park, processes all the immigration uh, applications that come through, through the, uh, the country. So before it goes out to the field offices, they review them and then it goes out to the field offices. Important to know that's actually a fee for service. When someone does try to apply for citizenship, they actually pay and that's the, that fee is actually paid by the person that's applying. But again, it's processed here in the Kansas City area. The famous green cards, or even red cards for some people who are not familiar with that, green, all green card processing is done here in Kansas City. Uh, the National Records Center, which is you know, one of our many cave units in the Kansas City area, uh, they, they uh, maintain and they s store all the immigration records that, uh, that are, have basically ever been done that are, are still around here in Kansas City area. Obviously, providing security to our nation. Fort Leavenworth, uh, you know, uh, the, certainly the, uh, the academic structure of the, of the Army right here in the, our area. Uh, Lake City Army Ammunition Plant, for those of you who don't know, that at, out in uh, Independence actually makes all the small arms ammunition for, for the complete United States uh, military as well as all, all of our NATO partners. Again, all, all done here in Kansas City. And then the National Nuclear Security Administration out south of Kansas City, they make 85% of all nuclear weapons are, are built there, nothing, nothing radioactive or such, but they were started there and then shipped to their final destination and, of course, then put out, out, in, the, out in the field. Uh, watching over the sky, the uh, Olathe Air Traffic Control Center covers 10 states, um, so pretty much the whole southwest, midwest areas done here in Kansas City, as well as the National Aviation Severe Weather Service up by our airport. They cover the complete uh, western hemisphere of the world for, any, for all aviation uh, weather that goes out. They, they're the ones that basically make the recommendations and let, let them know. We're also the nation's checkbook. Uh, Kansas City, by 2025, will have one of only two IRS campuses. Everything, they're structuring to try to go online, but all paper forms will eventually go into the state of art, art uh, IRS campus that we, that's located in uh, downtown Kansas City. Uh, but also, the Bureau of Fiscal Service pays out 90%, 99%, excuse me, of all payments done by the federal government, again, here in the Kansas City area. There's still paper checks they send out, but even if it's, a, uh, if it's aid to a foreign country or any electronic funds, that all comes out, out of the fiscal, uh, Bureau of Fiscal Service. And I like to s s call us also the nation's attic. I'd like to, but Smithsonian has a, a trademark on that. So I call us our, the storage pod for the government. Uh, National Archives and Records Administration has uh, three caves here in the Kansas City area that store, storing our uh, um, national records, as well as Social Security, Post Office, IRS, all have their national storage systems here in the, the caves in the Kansas City area. So again, we do make a big impact in uh, you know, of the history of the, of the uh, federal government. A lot of it's located here in Kansas City. This is our organization structure, kind of give you an idea. We go from the president down to the office personnel management, and then it goes to the chairperson. Our current chairperson is Michael Copeland, who's the general administrator for General Services Administration, and he oversees three vice chairs that works on those, those uh, uh, mission components. And then we have several, we have basically nine working committees that work throughout the year on different programs, and also another six seasonal ones that, again, we'll talk about here right now. So before we get started on the, the, uh, the, the lines of business, does anyone have any questions as far as what we've discussed so far? Yes, sir. Is one of the Postal Service caves just east of Parkville? No. Uh, okay. Postal Service does, their, their cave is in the Hunt Midwest, so right south of, uh, of Worlds of Fun. Okay. So all the, uh, all stamps that they, once they're printed and before they get shipped to different post offices go there. Also the, uh, the souvenir stamps or the, um, um, the collector stamps additions are, are done there. And if you happen to be, be in that, then it's shipped out of that, that cave system. Okay. So, Again, a perfect situation because it's climate controlled naturally year round. So uh, again, it's a great way to, for the government to save money. 
So, first line of business, emergency preparedness, security, and employee safety, and probably our most important one. So some of the things that we do with that, uh, again, a lot of it's collecting and sharing emergency information, but uh, so with that in mind, we maintain a emergency notification system, so we, we are in contact and able to contact every FEB member or every lead of every agency in case of emergency. Um, so we, it goes through, a, uh, the Everbridge system goes through either cell, cell uh, work phone or, or email or text. So again, uh, if there is an emergency, we maintain that database. We are the ones that, uh, that do make the recommendations for the emergency dismissal plan. So we have what we call our 3 a.m. club. And what that is, those are the six individuals that get up at 3 a.m. if there is a uh, large snow, snow emergency or such like that, start getting on the phone with the highway patrol, the weather service, and then they make a re recommendation if the government should be open or, or should close or if there's a, you know, or delayed, delayed arrival or so forth. More often than not, most of the federal agencies, at least in the Kansas City area, are telework, uh, um, um, are, have the ability to telework. So we'll try to get the message out the day before we know a big snowstorm is to let them know, hey, take your computers home and we will let you know if you know, we will have unscheduled leave or telework. But uh, in the instance that, uh, that basically it does take a act of the, the governor or the, the mayor to say, we really need you off the street. Uh, if we do need to, to close the government for a day, that's, that comes from that committee. We also have uh, four closed points of dispensing, or pods. Um, Fort Leavenworth actually has a pod, but if those are not familiar with the, the pod concept, in the, in the effect of a national influenza breakout, or let's say, for example, the measles took a strange strange form and it's uh, basically became a, a huge breakout that your immunization didn't work or, or anymore. Uh, so the local municipalities have to be able to stand up emergency shelters. Now Kansas City's Health Department is one of the, the best out there. However, we're the largest employer, how can we help with that? So in Kansas City, we have four closed pods just for our fe federal employees. With that, if you have a PIV card, you can go out. We'll ha with our closed pods, we, have, we train our own volunteers to, to dispense medication. Say there is, you know, we'll, we'll open up a location down our downtown federal building. Uh, people come in with a, their PIV cards. They're able to get medication for themselves, their families, or extended families they, they wish to. The, the, federal, the, uh, the city health department is thrilled because that really takes out 160,000 people off their roster who they're supposed to take care of. Now, Kansas City is also a pilot program for, for, for the CDC. Uh, which is called, uh, I think it's an unfortunate name, but called the last mile. Uh, so, which, which means that we also, our pod volunteers go out into the public and then open up other, other pod locations for the, for the civilians out there. So we're working, and some of you may be familiar with the DHS surge force for uh, rough hurricanes or such, where they, we bring extra folks in where FEMA cannot control everything. So that's kind of what the last mile would be doing is to bring extra volunteers in to, to help with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the city's work on that. Um, the Field Federal Safety Health Council, for those of you not familiar with that, everyone's familiar with OSHA. Well, this is the federal government's OSHA, and the Fort Leavenworth's involved in this as well. Just like uh, the civilian workforce um, or the, um, the corporate workforce, you have to have safety officers, you have to abide by OSHA rules. So the Field Federal Safety Health Council, which we oversee, basically does those OSHA compliance uh, for our federal agencies throughout the, the, the Kansas City area. And then also we have our Kansas City Regional COOP Working Group. Those are COOP uh, uh, officers within each location to get together on a monthly basis, do tabletop exercises, whether it's a cyber attack on their agency or a, uh, a loss of integrity as far as uh, through their uh, through their systems, um, and they, uh, so they, they will practice that. Then every year we also do a regional exercise, and that's called Casey Rice or Regional Interagency Coop Exercise. Government loves acronyms, so we just keep making them up, uh, which we put on each year. So this last one, uh, July 25th of last year, was a uh, severe winter storm happening on July 25th. 
Well, you can't exercise actually a winter storm in the winter, otherwise it may be too late. But in that case, you had the, the uh, uh, in this, this uh, event, basically folks were unable to get to their workstations, so they had to open up their continuity plans to and implement that and work off their continuity site. For those of you who are not familiar, if a tornado hits you know, a Social Security office uh, overnight, they have within 24 hours to stand up another office somewhere else. So, I mean, that's what the continuity planning does. It's, and the practice does also. So that allows them the time to get up and running within that uh, specific time. Is the uh, guard involved in that? It is, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions on this line of business? Any suggestions as far as other things we should look at? Our next line of business, and probably one that keeps us busiest, is the workforce development and support. Um, with that, we, we tout over $3 million in cost avoidance in, in 2018, and we tout that through our interagency trainings, whether it's uh, supervisory, career development, or soft skills. Uh, financial management awareness programs, and we'll discuss that a little bit. Our diversity education awareness, our alternative dispute res resolution shared neutrals program, and then also, uh, you know, we, we also are responsible for recruitment and retention. So we'll break those down a little bit. So happy to, to note that we do have a, a, a partnership with Army Management Staff College. So there is an agreement that we're able to send individuals uh, uh, to the Army Management Staff College once they go through their online distance learning. They're able to, get, able to go to the three four, or four week course uh, here, here locally. We have worked with uh, the General Staff Command College and uh, developed the Senior Executive Leadership Training, which is done through KU, but I actually, I believe most of uh, the participants also attend a class at, with KU as well, correct? Have we done that yet? No. Not yet? Okay, all right. So that's, that's something that we've offered to our Senior Executive uh, service members here in the Kansas City area. Again, looking at the need, you know, our SES members, so on the, on the uh, career side, the senior executive service is the, the, the highest level you can get in the federal government. You know, it, most of the civilian uh, members are on a GS scale from 1 to 15, so SES is one step above that. Now, they have a uh, requirement to still have continuous training. Unfortunately, there's not wasn't much around the Kansas City area, so they uh, either had to go to Boston or D.C. to get their training. So we were able to work, again, uh, with Mr. Brown's help and the uh, uh, Command General Staff College, we were able to develop a program that would serve, service that right, you know, 30 miles away from their door. Um, we also develop, have a advanced leadership training through the, through the University of, of Kansas. Uh, we participate in the President's Management Council or Interagency Rotation Program. What that is, um, to be part of the SES, you typically have to have different details or deployments from two other agencies. So this allows um, um, high potential grade 13s on up to go do a rotation at a different, different uh, federal agency. So, for example, we, we swapped this... Uh, we're currently going on one. Our, our uh, cohort goes from April to September each year. So FEMA has swapped individuals with GSA. We actually have someone on our staff from, from FEMA as well. We have someone from VA actually up here in Fort Leavenworth, I believe. So uh, again, so that gives them opportunity to learn new skills and then take that back to their, to their, uh, their home agency. Supervised refresher training, again, instead of, you know, ultimately what it comes down to, instead of uh, our cost savings, instead of sending 10 different federal agencies to D.C. for the same training, we put it on here locally. So not only is there cost savings to the, the trainers, trainers' costs, instructors' costs here in Kansas City compared to D.C., but also there's no tra travel cost or per diem that goes along with that. We also started a new Federal Emerging Leaders Development Program, and that is focused towards our middle management or upcoming managers from a GS 9 through 12s, and it goes through an application process and gets them ready for the next step. We continue with that with, uh, we, we, have, we bring in different uh, trainings. 
Uh, Leadership Goes to the Movies, where uh, that one we basically took different movies and the leadership qualities. So you look at Braveheart, you look at Glory, and you see how exactly that, those leadership qualities uh, played into that. Uh, lean management training. Uh, uh, several federal agencies are focused on uh, uh, Lean Six Sigma programs, EPA, VA, very much involved in that. Many of you are familiar with that. So again, what we're trying to do is to build a forum of all the federal agencies out there that have lean programs to be able to work together. Now, to be an effective lean program, you have to have a project you're focusing on, but this way you have someone else to go to in case you have, have questions as far as on your ticker pro- project that's going through the same thing. Uh, dealing with poor performers, usually we have that around uh, uh, um, review times. Uh, winning culture and government with Franklin Covey. So sometimes a lot of these we will put on uh, free of charge, for, for example, we work a deal with the office personnel management to bring in folks to do the dealing with poor performers. Uh, Franklin Covey, for example, that's one where we, we have folks registered through them, we just set up the space. But a lot of what, what we do is also reimbursable. So if we have a program, um, I'm getting in here, sorry. So, so for example, Crucial Conversations. Crucial Conversations is a program that's uh, uh, taught by Vital Smart, and it's very, it's, it's about, you know, it's a two-day course to talk about how to make that, you know, you've got, you, you have a problem with the employer, you have problems with other folks in your, your staff, how do you have that conversation with it? Now, this is a course that's taught all over the, the country by Vital Smarts for $1,400 for two days. So, and they sell out all the time. They come to Kansas City, they open up at Doubletree, and they, they put on the course. So we were able to train someone in that course and offer that to our federal employees for $299. So that's the cost savings. So we were saving so much money, we were actually having people from federal employees from D.C. flying to Kansas City to take our training instead of doing it, doing it uh, there in D.C. Six core competencies. Uh, again, in the, uh, OPM goes through the, uh, the, uh, the core competencies that every, every uh, executive should know. And we, again, practice, keep those skills going up with programs like Think and Act Like a Leader. So those are some of the management uh, supervisory programs that, that we uh, work on. Am I clicking in the right way, Ron? Okay. So we've also started doing a few more soft skills, um, such as instructor development training. We have a week-long course where uh, we're teaching folks how to give proper instruction or how to basically, uh, you know, facilitate meetings. Uh, we do, we focus on uh, not only the management staff, but also, you know, uh, building our administrative staff. Business writing and grammar skills has been a, uh, something that's been very popular over the past few years. Who knew, but maybe you guys knew, that's, I guess there's not good grammar in the federal government. So that's a course we generally have to repeat two or three times each year. And we also, just like the, the Simon Center, we have, a, we have a monthly seminar, or we do ours on a webinar series to, to kind of try to keep everyone's uh, skills refreshed. I apologize, there we go. One thing, and we actually had this coming up on June 5th here at the uh, Frontier Center. Uh, we do several pre-retirement uh, programs. And you see that it's, it's not just a nice background that you see there. It is uh, the wave of retirement. Could we go back one? See back there? Okay. So, uh, so we see the wave of retirement. So we put on pre-retirement seminars uh, three or four times each year. Uh, last year we had over 700 folks that participated in those seminars uh, to get them prepared for the, the next uh, stage of their life. The wave kind of re- really indicates right now over 50% of all federal employees are el- eligible to retire within the next 10 years. So we have to, you know, we want them to be ready to retire. Uh, we work with them through other, other programs. Uh, you know, one of the biggest things we hear from the pre-retirement seminars Boy, I wish I would have gotten this 30 years ago. So that's why we also have uh, early and mid-career seminars as well. So again, OPM encourages federal agencies to touch 
touch a uh, federal employee at least three times during their uh, their uh, work career, uh, allowing the, uh, giving them opportunities to learn about how to manage their their finances for for retirement. So finally, one more, please. Thanks. So uh, with that, so we have our Diversity Education Cultural Committee, which uh, works on diversity events th uh, throughout the years. Uh, we also, again, we, we take opportunity to, to recognize our federal employees each year as well. This year, especially uh, being Public Employees uh, Recognition Week, or this week being Public Employee Recognition Week, uh, we actually just had, I didn't have a chance to update that slide, but we just had this year's uh, event yesterday at the uh, uh, Municipal Auditorium. Uh, we are the only FEB that actually does Public Employees Recognition Week with the uh, city and county as well. So we had opportunity to have uh, Mayor Sly James as well as uh, um, um, uh, Frank White, who's the, the uh, Jackson County Commissioner, there to uh, celebrate with us. Our Cultural Educational Awareness Committee, again, works on diversity issues. We have monthly programs, our Martin Luther King Luncheon, community outreach, and then we also have uh, every other year we do a Unity Day program, uh, which again gives best practices as far as uh, on diversity and how to uh, make an impact of that within, the, uh, within their own federal agencies. So two more slides, please. One more. Thank you. So another big cost uh, avoidance for us is our Alternative Dispute Resolution Program. So with that, we have over a hundred trained mediators that are uh, certified to go out and do mediations across the federal federal government. So the, this is an interagency program that so if you have have a agency that you have two employees that just can't get along together or you have an employee and supervisor uh, problem, you can call our hotline. We'll schedule a, a mediator plus a, usually one or two co-mediators come out and try, try to resolve that problem before it goes to an EEO complaint. And that's the big, big thing uh, about that. If it goes to EEO complaint, that's the minimum cost on that's going to be $75,000 because that's when the, the lawyers get involved. So the, the opportunity to try to mediate the, the program before it goes to that uh, really is a huge cost savings for the federal government. Uh, last year, uh, we had $1.2 million in cost savings out of that program. We have over 70% success rate on these mediations, so it really do, does work. Uh, many agencies, again, have mediators within their own, own uh, system. I know, again, the DOD has, has professional mediators already set up, but a lot of times that is a conflict for some of the parties. They want someone neutral. Well, I, don't, I know Joe in USDA. I don't want someone that knows my personal problems going through that, so we'll bring someone from IRS in to, to work on that problem. So, again, we continue to, continue to work on that. Uh, we are actually the model that uh, Washington, D.C. actually took, took hold of to actually re, restart their program in, uh, in the Beltway this past year. Okay, next one. So response to recruitment and attention. So our Human Resources Committee, as well as you also have Education Training Committee, we look at ways that we can recruit. We, we said that 50% you know, of federal employees are eligible to retire. Well, the sad thing is only 10% of our federal, federal employee workforce is under 30. So we really need to get some, some folks recruiting and working that way. So, uh, so we work with uh, um, university fairs. We work with different universities to try to, uh, and again, what our, our goal is instead of having going into a university job fair and having Social Security here, EPA, DHS, DOD, maybe all you know on separate tables. We do one joint table because the majority of all of our applications are going through USA Jobs anyway. So this way we can make a bigger impact, have the staffing, so we can actually show them how USA Jobs works, uh, and then try to get them um, more interested in working for the the federal government. We are also a pilot program um, th that was just announced last month for what's called the Government to University Initiative. And that's being uh, focused, f it's coming out of the Office of Management and Budget uh, from a, a, uh, a rotation they did there. 
And our goal is to, again, try to encourage more folks to come into the federal government right out of, out of college. The one of the things, and, and it's a twofold education, we're trying to find out, again, with universities, how can we educate uh, or, you know, how, how can we communicate to your, uh, your um, uh, students of the opportunities of the federal government, but also what's, what are some new skills that we need to develop? What are some new courses? So we already have a committee working, so 20 years out, what jobs of the federal government do we not need? You know, artificial intelligence is going to take care of this job. We talked about the, you know, the, all, the IRS campus. Do we really need people doing paper stuff? Do we need people within the USCIS looking at immigration forms, or can that be done electronically? So we're, we're already looking at that skills. We're looking at providing amped up programs in IT where we recruit folks and almost off uh, similar to uh, to a, a corporate business where we pay you for three, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna reimburse your, your college loans and you're gonna have to work for us for three years. And if you wanna go to the next level, you maybe you work for another three years. It's also another educational opportunity to go back to the federal agencies because so many times the federal agencies have recruited, hey, come work for the government, you'll have a career for life. The new generation does not wanna have a career for life. They wanna work for, be somewhere for three years and go somewhere and try something else. Now, until they get into it, they don't realize that they can do that right in the federal government. They may start in Social Security, but then all of a sudden go to EPA and then find something else. You know, you look on, on USA Jobs of all the different things that you could ever imagine that's out there, they may st still spend 30 years in the government, they just don't realize it. But we're gonna, we need to make sure the agency, uh, agencies are, are aware and knowledgeable that, you know, it's okay. Let them leave after three years and make them feel welcome to come back because we want you to spend your time in the government. We want to get the most we can out of you. You come back, build, you, you go out, build your skills some more, you're always welcome back. So again, it's, it's an educational thing that we have to do on both sides for the students as well as for our, our hiring agencies. Hey, it's okay that if we don't get career employees, we make the biggest impact that we can for our of, of the next three years. Um, so with that, we, we do different things, like we have an intern enrichment program that we, uh, we uh, during the summertime, we'll, we'll take them on tours of all the different federal agencies to kind of get an idea of, all, of what's out there. We have an interagency mentoring program for so the, those younger employees that are coming, coming in. We set them up with, uh, with mentors. They'll, again, a lot of larger federal agencies will have their own mentoring program, which is perfect. But we also have a lot of small agencies that only have six folks. So it's important that we, we have an opportunity for them out there as well. So that's where the whole interagency uh, opportunity comes in. And of course, information sharing and recruitment. Again, we're kind of like the Chico Council. When those memos come to us from the Chico Council, we're getting it out to the local HR folks. Okay, next slide, please. So through all the workforce, the ADR and such, we're just a little bit shy. If we could have got one more person to a training, we would have broke uh, $2.3 million last year in cost savings. Now, again, that doesn't cover travel or such like that, but those are th quantitative things that we could say, yeah, if you went out, this person went out to uh, even a local uh, uh, provider, uh, they would have paid that much more. So that's where Rod, and again, thank you for, for the opportunity to uh, to talk about, you know, that's where we kind of show what we're doing uh, in the cost savings component for the for the feds. So, any question, questions about the workforce development? Yes, sir. So, is all this training available to Department of Defense uh, employees here at Fort Leavenworth? Absolutely. So, we just register, and how would you pay for that? Do we do it with a credit card, or how do we actually pay? That is a great question. So, it, it depends. So, um, so all, everything we do, we, we do all registrations online. KansasCity.feb.gov is our website. We'll have that posted here at, at the end. So, now, our distribution, because of the way, way we're set up, our, who's our member? General Lundy. Okay, right. Or, you know, or someone who, who, who they're designated to. So, a lot of times, that message does not get down all the way. 
and I, and I get that. So we try to, if we have folks off of education committee, we, we try to get those, that information out about those trainings that way, or if, you know, HR committee. So a lot of times you may not hear about it because the stuff doesn't get distributed, and, and that's okay. So if you wanna be you know, proactive, go to our website. We have on our websites the uh, uh, calendar events for the, for the next year. Sure. So uh, again, going back to how you can pay for it, Credit card, uh, most uh, organizations, we do, we do encourage doing the government credit card. That, the auditors like to do that instead of doing cash. Um, most agencies, you have to fill out a SF-182. I don't know if that's the same thing with DOD. That's just justification for training, spending training dollars. So, But uh, again, all those things are available to you. Okay. Hey, Larry, I'd like to add one thing on that. Mm -hmm. Certainly the agency head sits as a member of the FEB but you still have the committees, right? We do. They have a series of committees. So like when I was at SBA, I sat on what was called the Veterans Committee. And there was me and the, the, the deputy for the Kansas City VA headed that committee as the FEB board members. But our whole entire committee was probably 40 people. They were largely veterans, but they sat on the VA, but they were anywhere from GS4s to 13s that worked out in the force. So in addition to just having General Lundy or someone he designates here, you could certainly sit on one of the committees if you just were aware that, you know, the FEB, and they usually meet once a month at some place, location around the city. So you could participate like in the Human Resources Committee. It would be right in line, you know, with your functions here that would not only probably help Fort Leavenworth and or DO, DA here, but could also get a lot of HR information out to the rest of the civilian community about the kind of things that happen here. So I think that's also something that's yep. overlooked is your ability to participate in a committee as a federal employee, you can just participate. Yep. So uh, are those uh, online to see? Th they are, and thank you, Rod. And that's, that is something every October, the first of the fiscal year, we do send out a message out to uh, the agency heads asking, tell them, okay, here's, here's a, who's on all, your, all of our committees. Are they, can they, you know, do you want to add someone? Do you want to take anyone off? Just justification that, hey, these guys are okay to participate. So the, many of the committees that uh, we kind of breeze through, the ADR committee, so if you have someone that uh, does uh, mediation or we just started a facilitation cadre or working on a facilitation cadre in our agency program, um, that's the program. There's an education training committee that uh, we do have uh, Dr. Brunk that uh, actually sits, sits on that uh, for Fort Leavenworth, but again, we're always looking for individuals. The HR committee, uh, we talked about the federal field, um, uh, federal field health and safety council, the COOP working group. So those are just some of the committees that that we discussed uh, so far. And ne ne next, we're going to talk about some of the other. Again, they meet monthly. Uh, we'll talk some of the other ones: veterans, small business, regional wellness. So again, uh, yeah, there's. Plenty of plenty of space for you. So, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Yes. Yep. I wanted to ask you about the pre-retirement uh, training, the mm -hmm. seminars they have. Um, I don't mean to make a paid political announcement here. I, everybody knows I'm with First Command, but our job, our mission statement, we take seriously is coaching those who serve in their pursuit of financial security. And I'm here to tell you at least on the DOD side, which I've worked with personally and came up through, there's never been a time in my career where I wasn't hearing, you gotta go to this pre-retirement seminar. Gee, I wish I'd known this stuff 20 years ago when I was getting started. Uh -huh. It never seems to change on the DOD side. <laughs> You've got a bigger view. I wanted to know, is there anybody in government who is doing it right that we could look to for how to train our workforce when they're younger and can take advantage of it? The other agencies outside DOD, does anybody get it well, right? Well, normally I would count, I would uh, start with DOD. The other, other ones as far as regional, and it, it really goes back to leadership, as you know. Uh, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service is very proactive. Uh, and they send a lot of people to the early career. I mean, they'll have 50 people to the early career. And then that's what we're talking about. Could they, you play a role in maybe getting some of what they do to transfer over to the other agencies? I try. <laughs> uh, there's a big need for it. I know. I I totally understand. And there is a big. Uh, I mean, there's a large demand. I mean, we're we're actually oversold for the 
the training here in here in Fort Leavenworth. Um, for that yeah. for years to get that up here because it normally had been habitually down in Kansas City and you've got a large workforce right, right. here on this installation yeah. you know thousand people every day eligible for retirement and so they brought that seminar here specifically but as he said it always sells out right so, so it's just never enough hanging seen. fruit it just drives me crazy I I'm told 30 percent of our civil service workforce does not take advantage of the full five percent match they could get on their TSP. Right. Uh, I'm sure there might be some that they really can't afford to contribute 5% to their retirement. But I'm betting most of those people just don't know what they don't know. And it seems crazy that leadership somewhere up and down isn't required to train the workforce to know that while they're young. They are required. Do they do it? That's the question. All right. So yes, OPM does require them to do, do that, uh, but do they follow through? So. Our HR committee uh, does does uh, does talk about that. The education committee, one of their biggest biggest programs, is to the financial awareness programs. So I mean, they're the ones that kind of help us put on the uh, uh, pre-retirement and the early career. Um, however, even even with the HR committee, we have over 100 members, mm -hmm. but we have 160 different federal agencies. So not everyone's at the table, right. and and not everyone can afford to. Like I said some of those agencies we count are six people. So they're not able to, you know, have a staff attend everything. But, you know, at the very least, we encourage them, for example, for the uh, HR committee, you know, put yourself. If you're, the, if you're the FEB member or the agency head, it doesn't cost anything just to get these emails. And yeah. at least you're hearing what the Chico Council is saying, what the new TSP rules are, are doing. So like the early career, I mean, we've got, we, we paid for TSP to, for four hours to, you know, to fly out there and charge us per hour, but yeah. to fly to Kansas City to give a four hour presentation on TSP and the importance of it. So, but I've only got a hundred people signed up for that. So <laughs> the message is not getting out. All right. So. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No, yeah. thanks. Thanks. It's, you understand my struggle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm living that as well. <laughs> but thank you for that. Mary? Yes. If it, if it, Uh -huh. If I have somebody who wants to do that, is it a one for one? Do I because do I just lose that person? Or do, they, do I get someone else in their in their place? That's a great question. So maybe. So when we when we do that program, we solicit for candidates as well as projects. Now we try to solicit three times as many projects as we do candidates because ultimately. What we do is we, we have them review what their top projects are. And they'll narrow it down immediately to three projects, and they'll interview for those three, and then pick out their top project. And, and as long as it's, you know, if that person is approved by you to participate in your project, everything's golden, you know? Um, and usually that's the case. Um, so, I'm all about projects. Yeah. I'm just not all about having to pick up another person. Well, well yeah. And that's, that's the, the biggest problem is we haven't been getting as many projects. We were, again, another pilot program to try to do that twice a year, do one in the spring, one in the fall, but we couldn't get enough projects. So, I mean, if you have projects that you would like to, to put forth, that actually builds the candidate pool. Um, so, I mean, it, there's, but there's no guarantee. But as you put a candidate in there, obviously they're looking at another program maybe with a FEMA or, you know, USDA or such, they go down there and you may be, uh, you know, may have a hole. What I found, though, that most of the agencies that are kind of used to deployments, DOD being, being one, DO, folks with a military background, if they have an agency head with a military background or FEMA, because they're used to, well, where'd that guy go for, you know, for two months, they're okay with that. They understand those skills, they've learned to adapt. But again, going back to Teaching, reteaching our our members or the the leadership to how to hire and how to work with a new workforce or how to educate the work, new workforce. It goes back to you know again you have to be adaptable. These are things that's something that the younger generation wants. They want the opportunity to investigate. So, thanks. Okay. Yes, sir. There was uh, one little bullet that was easily overlooked. It had to do with uh, uh, developing writing skills. Yep. 
Well, I retired from 04, and my last 16 and a half years were with the Center for Army Lessons Learned. And as a TRADOC organization, we could uh, levy other TRADOC organizations to send us subject matter es experts, depending on what the unit was or what we were trying to collect against. And then we get these reports in, and you have the issue statement, and then you may have two, three, or four, or five paragraphs. And when you get down to the lesson learned, it doesn't relate to the issue statement. Right. And uh, they don't have an introductory sentence to start a paragraph. They don't have a transition sentence to the next paragraph. Mm -hmm. And we never had time to train them. These are captains and majors, you know, even some lieutenant colonels. They should have learned this in college, but they, they didn't. And so that, that uh, piqued my interest because uh, writing skills are an important part of our ability to communicate. And, uh, so it, it really is. And it, it, but you, you'd be happy to know, actually, for our Federal Emerging Leaders Program, as well as uh, we also have OPM come in and they do a six-month leadership development program. So part of it is writing skills. They don't go into like the two days as the business writing course does. And quite frankly, that's a little bit uh, more remedial than what, what you're looking at uh, or what you're talking about. But you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I'm not talking about the guys who put a dot above an E. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but it's just amazing that these college graduates cannot write any better than they write. And it's not the large majority, but uh, a third of them for sure, I think. And we've read a lot of issue statements and lessons learned. Anyway, that's just oh, my comment. I understand. Well, and I, I will tell you that, uh, yes, so, because we just got through our review, our Public Employee Recognition Week Awards, and I'm also reviewing a, several national applications for CFC Heroes and the Government, gears for government awards as well and even nationally I was shocked and this is a national award and this is how you're wording that so I totally understand where you're coming from. In retirement I've taken some lifetime learning courses at the University mm -hmm. of St. Mary. It's not going to get any better <laughs> because some of my professors there that when I first started taking courses that was one of their fir first comments these young people, and simply because they don't write, they write in short little phrases that they can't put together a sentence because of uh, their texting, yeah, texting and all that, and, and that's a real challenge just to get them to be able to write a complete sentence or paragraph. They're very intelligent people, students. I mean, they're, some of them are way over my head, but. It's not going to get any better. Well, and, and actually, I'm glad you guys bring up this because, again, I think this is something we all need to learn from because if we're not going to be able to fix it, how do we adapt? Yeah. So we may not like it, but how do we adapt? Because we have a whole generation that grew up on their phones and they're typing that way, and we're not going to be able to retrain all of them or they're not going to accept the training. So as managers, how do we adapt to that? The other side of that coin. They understand what each other Right, is. right. I mean, and, I, and I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, they know what they're saying to each other. So, I don't know. I, I think I would. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I really like coming up to these things, because I learn just as much as you guys, you know, ideas that I can take back and say, hey, this is another thing. When we're talking to this government to university thing, this is another thing we need to look at. You know most of them can. And, and that's, again, when we look at... That's a problem with with uh, USA Jobs because those same folks are trying to apply in USA Jobs. And how many of you applied on USA Jobs? Or you know, yeah, it's 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 not user friendly. And especially if you're a millennial and you're used to texting, you know, twenty word messages, you're not going to do two hundred words. So we got to get past that. So thank you for bringing that up. So I, we have a meeting here in two weeks. So I will I will mention that. That's good stuff. Okay, next slide, please. We're, we're on the downstretch. So, uh, line of business three, intergovernmental uh, uh, and interagency collaboration and community outreach. 
that's where we go out in the community. One more, please. Okay. So some of this uh, strategic partnerships, we work with the Mid-America Regional Council, uh, Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, city, state, and county. So again, we're kind of the point person for the government instead of, you know, uh, 160 agencies working with the, uh, with the chamber, we'll be their, their spokesperson then. Federal no networking opportunities, the FEB members meet on a monthly basis, so they have an opportunity to see each other and share with what's going on. We talked about public employee recognitions. Uh, those are also things that are available for you. We work with the, the, the Speedway, the Chiefs, the Royals to have special discounted recognition days. Um, anything philanthropic that's across the federal governments, like uh, CFC, we oversee the Combined Federal Campaign, or Day of Caring, which is a full day of volunteering that's that's coming up here in uh, this next month we, we oversee. Uh, and then, of course, the Special Emphasis Councils, which, again, we'll, we'll touch on those briefly. One more slide, please. Uh, we're also the welcome mat for the uh, several agencies that are looking to put on programs. The President's Management Agenda. This is the President's Management Agenda is uh, every president, when they come in, within a year, they have to set up their, their business plan, their strategic plan for their, their term. Uh, for the first, first time ever outside the D.C. area, they released it in Kansas City. So Kansas City was able to be the, uh, the, uh, the host city for the President's Management Agenda. Uh, we, we hosted NATO and their, uh, and, uh, their uh, medical group here in Kansas City. First time they've ever met as a group in the United States, interesting enough. They met 43 times, never met in the United States, and came to Kansas City. Uh, most recently, we, we uh, hosted NORAD and, and uh, NORTHCOM for the New, New, Adred, uh, New Madrid um, uh, exercise. So that, that will be coming up here next month. So next slide. Combined federal campaign, again, uh, thank you for your donations in the past and this, this year. This again uh, doesn't have last year's, but uh, uh, typically we raise well, over, well into the million dollars as far as gifts towards combined federal campaign. So again, we organize the volunteers that oversee the, the uh, applications as well as the uh, volunteers that go out and do the solicitations and such. Just uh, an experience with the federal campaign. Mm -hmm. So while I was working at, you know, the, CFC campaign came around every year, and so I said fifteen or twenty dollars to. There was a list to the NRA, and subsequently that was supposed to be duct, uh, deducted from my my pay, and then it never was. So some liberal up there said the NRA is not going to get that twenty bucks. That's, that's all. <laughs> to it. I thought it was kind of kind of cute. <laughs> but, I, who knows how, what happened to that, that side. But. If so. we do want to donate to you, is, it to, is there a category federal executive board or who are we donating? There is to? not. Uh, no. So, so all the, uh, just kind of give you an idea, um, yeah, all the agencies are, are no, non-profits, 501c3s. Okay. Um, First Command, I know you have the charitable organization, you might be it be okay. in it but um, uh, but again they have to apply and then also reviewed and screened and approved to be, be part of that campaign so now I know we do have some retirees here they just the last two years they also allowed retirees to start donating to their favorite charity uh, through their annuities as well so again you can go on to it's uh, CFC today okay. during that time frame okay yeah. okay next slide please Day of Caring, we talked about that briefly. We're actually, uh, we celebrated our 25th anniversary of Day of Caring last year. Uh, with, uh, we had over 400 federal employees going out and working on different uh, uh, projects throughout the, the Kansas City area. And we've had several uh, locations here in the Fort Leavenworth area that also uh, participate in. Next slide. Here are some of our groups that we work with. Again, some of the interagency groups that meet on a monthly basis. The Regional Wellness Council, again, Try, again, another thing for the, the younger employees. They want to work in a healthy, you know, a, a, an agency that has some healthy choices, if you will. So Regional Wellness Council works on wellness initiatives and other things that's for our uh, employee population. Our small business uh, networking events, so net, uh, co connecting small business owners with the government contracts, so teaching them how to do, do business with the government. Veterans Affairs Committee, which uh, Rod 
uh, dis discuss. So we have veterans, uh, we have basically members that are, which have their own committees within their own workplace, but the, the big group basically meets monthly to discuss uh, upcoming initiatives and opportunities for veterans, and they take that back to their, their own workforce. And then go Young Government Leaders, that is a nonprofit that actually meets on a monthly basis as, as well. Uh, and then again, volunteer opportunities. Everyone's familiar with Toys for Tots. We work with the Marines on that. Feds Feeds Families, food drives, school supplies, so forth. We kind of we kind of help oversee that. Again, you can find any information you want at kansascity.feb.gov. So the calendar is on the front. You can go through the entire year as we have updated on the, the left hand side as far as what's what's coming up immediately. Next slide. And you can also, if you if you're going somewhere else in the country, if you want to find out about the other FEBs, you can go to feb.gov. That is the national FEB website. I think the last slide. Oh, and here's how you can reach me. I also have cards, so if you want to contact me, uh, uh, otherwise you can just uh, reach out directly to me. Again, we're a two-person staff. You saw a lot of stuff we do. We're two-person staff. So again, we can't do that without a network of a lot of volunteers. We're very fortunate that the uh, federal agencies in the Kansas City area give us a lot of support. We have some great volunteers in those different committees that help us uh, succeed. So, any questions on anything we discussed today? I kind of ran up against my time. I know there's another meeting coming in, so I, I appreciate your patience, and, but I do welcome any questions. I'll hang around afterwards if you want to talk about other, anything's one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, Larry. Okay, thank you all so much, appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for attending. And once again, thank you for uh, attending our uh, interagency brown bags throughout the year. We look forward to seeing you back um, at the start of the fall for academic year 20. Thank you.